I, I didn't like Shakespeare. I, I didn't understand what was going on. It wasn't, it wasn't only until, you know, I had that one teacher, just that one person just kind of said, think about this, think about this, think about this. And it kind of went, right, now. Gemma Fairley and I'm the director of Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet is the story of boundaries and particularly how thin the boundary is between love and hate. It's a Romeo and Juliet about love in so many ways I think which is so exciting about it because it's about normal love, young love, Romeo and Juliet. It's also about your love of your mates you know. Bonvolio and Mercutio the people I walk to school with you know they're the, they're the mates you walk to school with and the ones you, you mess about with. All its work is, is, is timeless. Uh, what I love about it is you can just take one play and you can set it in any kind of, you can put any kind of theme or you can set it in a contemporary kind of basis, which is what we're doing, or you can take it, you know, years ago. And it's just all so relative. I think that's the best thing about it. It's all so relative to events, events that are happening today. And so you have it. We are going to be studying for just a few days the play that was mentioned in that intro video, which is Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. So today I wanted to give you a quick introduction to both Shakespeare and to his play, Romeo and Juliet. Now, of course, there are some of you who at this point hopefully are excited, but I'm sure there's also a couple of naysayers who are grumbling to themselves and thinking, eh, why do we got to learn about something old? Eh, old stuff, old stuff is lame. Okay. Uh, Let's get over that attitude quickly, okay? Of course, why would we want to learn about something that's old? People say, well, there's other stuff that's come out. Why, are, why is Shakespeare still such a big deal in our time? And that's a great question, honestly, okay? Now, think about Shakespeare. He was living about 500 years ago at this point, almost, uh, 450, whatever, okay? Um, when we study something that's older, it's usually for one of a few different reasons. Maybe because there's still something interesting about it, which I think I will be able to show you why that's the case with Shakespeare, right? They talked a bit about that in that video as well. Maybe it's because something still affects us nowadays, you know, or maybe because it's still relatable to us today. And I mean, technically all history affects us in some way and is relatable to us, right? But specifically, as far as Romeo and Juliet goes, I have an example that I think is gonna help you to understand why this play or why Shakespeare itself himself is still such a big deal. So let's imagine it's the late 1500s when Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet, okay? Imagine you're some sort of poor dirt farmer living in this time period, right? Unless you come from a rich family, you don't really get to go to school. Only people from rich families can go to school. It was not required for kids to go to school back then. So instead of being at school, you would be working out all day in the fields, just trying to scrape by to make enough food to eat. There are no stores, people grow their own food, right? And so at the end of the day, you're both physically and mentally and emotionally exhausted. You are just done. So what do you do for fun? What do you do to unwind? Well, honestly, probably just go home and sit in the dark. Okay, now that's a bit of an exaggeration, but there wasn't electricity, okay? Candles are expensive. And there's definitely no phones, no TVs, no video games, no computers, no electronics of any kind. And honestly, not even really books. Um, if you've never went to school, you don't know how to read. So why is your family going to own a bunch of books? So you don't really have much in your house to keep you busy once you're off work in the late hours of the day. Uh, so you'd probably just have to do something outside, right? Maybe play marbles in the dirt with a buddy or horseshoes if you're, you know, an older person. Or just, you know, I don't know, get super drunk all the time, try to drown away your worries. But neither of those sound like the best, most productive thing to do, right? Now, there was this one other thing called bear baiting. And I promise this really used to happen. This was a spectator sport where they would take a bear and tie it up to a wall or to a post, and then they would set dogs loose on it, and people would cheer and laugh as the dogs slowly tore the bear apart and killed it. It's kind of like a slightly more updated version of the Roman Colosseum, but it's still not very great. So if we want a pastime that doesn't involve being a look, messing with the dirt or spending all our money on alcohol, 
or watching animal cruelty, we had one more option and that was the theater. Okay. Now this was of course the best option. And I mean, theater is still something we do nowadays. Of course, we have more updated versions sometimes like musicals are a very big deal nowadays. And that's the main version that a lot of people get their fix for theater. Uh, but, you know, back in Shakespeare's day, they had musicals, but they also had other kinds of plays, too. And this was like their TV. This was like their Netflix, their movies, their YouTube, right? You wanted to see a new, exciting story that's come out. You're going to go to the theater to see what are the new ideas that these playwrights have come up with, right? And when you went to the theater, it wasn't just a bunch of people standing around in awkward, old-fashioned costumes. Sometimes people get this impression of Shakespeare as Everybody wore tights and they talked like this. Nah, no. You could go to this theater in Shakespeare's time and you could see magic with actually pretty good special effects considering they were hundreds of years old. You could see sword fights. You could see, you know, musical numbers, singing, dancing. In fact, most Shakespeare plays actually had music in them, which is something that nowadays a lot of even people who direct plays don't realize. Um, and you could also even just see girls and guys fighting each other for girlfriends and boyfriends getting into, can we call them cat fights? Sure. Um, you could see all of these things in a Shakespeare play. And you know, if you got bored, you could just uh, start yelling boo and throwing food at the performers. Like you've probably seen that in cartoons, but that is a stereotype because it actually used to be a thing. There were food vendors wandering around. And if you didn't like the show, you could just uh, throw things at the performer. Now, one thing that's really important to understand about Romeo and Juliet and Shakespeare in general is that the theater itself helped to determine the format for these plays. And that has influenced a lot of our modern entertainment. So I'm gonna show you a 360 degree tour of the Globe Theater. This is actually something I'm posting to our class website later. And you can see there are no chairs at least not on the bottom. If you were a regular old schmo, like you and I probably would be, you know, unless you were super rich, you would be what's called a groundling and you would be standing in a packed crowd, standing room only probably, down here on the floor. And the stage literally goes right up to there. So like I said, if you didn't like the show and you were holding a tomato or an apple or something, it would not have been very hard to throw it at the performers. So these playwrights have to try to think of something that's gonna keep everybody entertained, including people who don't have that much background knowledge, right? They're, they're not gonna get a ton of fancy jokes. They don't know anything about world history probably or current events. So you can't make jokes about those things for those people. On the flip side, higher up in the theater, we have all of these galleys and balconies, which is where the rich and famous, so to speak, would go, right? So the queen herself didn't actually go to this theater. She had them come to her in her palace. But everybody else, like your dukes, your duchesses, your earls, knights, I don't know if that, that was still a thing at that point, they were sitting up here in these galleys, right? And so Shakespeare and any playwright had to simultaneously think of something that would entertain everybody down here in the groundling section, but also entertain the rich, famous, and educated people who would come from far away to see plays. That's a pretty tricky thing to do. But then along comes this guy straight out of Stratford-upon-Avon, a small town that's a bit far away from London, named William Shakespeare. And he has the gift. He's able to come up with plays that really catch on with people because there is something for everybody. He's got romance for the romance lovers. Some of his plays are literally just about romance. And when the characters get emotional, they start to talk in beautiful poetry. What's in a name a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. I'm sure you've probably heard that quote before. That comes from Romeo and Juliet. He has all the other stuff that people like. You know, he's got the sword fights, the magic, the cat fights, the singing, the dancing, okay? He's also got dirty jokes. Uh, Romeo and Juliet actually starts with one of the hosts, sad to say. Okay, and he's got slapstick humor. We can see over on the right, right? The kind of just silly comedy, people getting smacked around, people doing goofy stuff. All of these things are incorporated into a lot of Shakespeare's plays because he was trying to make plays that everybody would enjoy. Okay, now I'm going to be honest, I'm not 
pointing out every single time there's a dirty joke in the Shakespeare play, specifically in Romeo and Juliet, but they're in there and you can probably tell sometimes by the body language of the performers, even if occasionally, you know, they used a little outdated language. And these were definitely something that appealed to the groundlings, the people standing near the stage. But I bet, let's be honest, a lot of the educated and fancy rich people probably enjoyed this type of humor too. It's a pretty common thing. Now, by the way, the play actually starts with these two doofuses named Samson and Gregory, right? And they are servants of Juliet's family, the Capulets, which you're going to hear more about that in a sec. Romeo and Juliet, right? Juliet, Capulet, Romeo is from a family called the Montagues. And this play literally starts with these two servants of Juliet's family bragging about how macho they are and making dirty jokes. And to make this clear, if you didn't know this already, the play of Romeo and Juliet centers around two families, the Capulets and the Montagues, that they just hate each other. And they've hated each other forever, and nobody really knows why at this point. But their families are along for the ride, and they run into each other on the streets, and they give each other looks. Sometimes they break out into fights. People have died already because of this feud that is going on between the two families. And no one even knows why at this point they're fighting. But the play literally starts with Gregory and Samson, these two servants of Juliet's family, bragging about, oh yeah, we're so tough. We're so tough. If we ran into any servants from Romeo's family, oh yeah, we totally take them. We totally take them. And then they do. And because they're dweebs, they don't actually start fighting them, but they're like trying to be macho still. So, so Samson has the bright idea to bite his thumb at the servants from Romeo's family, which for your information is the Shakespeare's time equivalent of flipping someone off. Okay, so he bites his thumb at these guys and they ultimately end up starting a giant street fight. Everybody's fighting, swords are drawn, people are punching, decking each other. It's basically turned into a sort of gang fight on the street. And that all happens within the first like four minutes of Romeo and Juliet. People are like, oh, Shakespeare, old fashioned, boring. No, these are things that people still identify with and can understand in our day. So I think that's one thing that's really important with Shakespeare, guys. We just have to get past this idea that there's so much old fashioned language, we're not going to understand things. That's not true. These are the same sorts of themes and ideas that happened back then that happen nowadays. People still hate each other, get into fights. People still love romance. People still love magic and imagination. And once you realize that there's something for everybody in these plays and you realize, oh yeah, like I'm going to be fine. I'm going to understand this. I'm going to enjoy this. And I, I do have to make a side note here. I can't believe that any teacher or person would ever just hand someone the script of the play and say, read the script. They're plays. They're meant to be watched. We're obviously going to be watching the play and watching scenes from the play as we experience this. So you just have to get past this idea that there's so much old fashioned language, you're not going to get it. No, the truth is you can usually get what's happening from watching the body language and the reactions of the characters alone. But speaking of language, not just old fashioned language. Okay. Have you ever watched a movie or, you know, I don't know, played a game, heard a song where you heard a really interesting or cool sounding quote, or it was just funny. And you're like, man, that's awesome. I'm going to take that, right? And you don't even consciously all the time think that. You're not trying to pass it off as your own. You just like it so much you start quoting it. Well, the thing is, one reason why we're studying Shakespeare is because people did this all the time with his stuff. They found themselves quoting him all over the place. Yeah, Shakespeare would sometimes find himself writing his plays and not having quite the right word for what he wanted to say, especially if he was trying to write a rhyming part where you know just there wasn't a good rhyming word and so what would he do he would just straight up invent words all these words are ones that are attributed to shakespeare supposedly he invented the word crocodile when he wanted to use the word alligator but he needed something that rhymed with the word nile right and um, it's actually supposed that we still use about 1700 words out of the many many words that shakespeare invented we still use about 1,700 of those words in our spoken language nowadays. Now, to be fair, Shakespeare didn't always invent these words that sometimes people think he invented. Sometimes he just took a word that people were already using like a little bit, but it wasn't very popular. And then Shakespeare used it in one of his plays and suddenly it's like, oh, everybody's saying it, right? And you know how that is, right? Somebody does something in a book or a movie or a show or whatever, and it's, it's popular enough, but it, it hasn't quite caught on. But then someone else does it, and suddenly it just blows up, 
right? Suddenly it's all over the place. Everyone knows it. Everybody's seen it. Maybe they don't even know where it originally came from. They just, they just say it or they just do it. So basically it blows up and it becomes viral. Wait, am I saying that Shakespeare was like the TikTok of his age? Ugh, ugh, yeah. Anyway, the point is, one reason why we're talking about Shakespeare and going to study one of his plays is because a lot of this stuff he did went viral. And he's still viral in our culture today. Shakespeare also invented a ton of clever phrases that we still use today. Just because his plays were so popular, the things he said cut on. Uh, this guy really just had a way with words. And you can see from this chart, not all of these are ones I've said, but I've said some of these before and I've definitely heard people say them too. So one of the reasons why people still talk about Shakespeare today is because we accidentally quote his plays all the time without even knowing it. So yeah, in conclusion, interesting stories with lots of different types of things that appeal to lots of different types of viewers, beautiful, memorable, and funny language, all of these are reasons why Shakespeare has been one of the biggest influences on the English language, and it's the reason that we still talk about him and study his works today. And Shakespeare is someone whose stories are still recreated, referenced, remixed, and parodied in a variety of forms today, as you can see from a few examples here. Okay, that was a very quick introduction to Shakespeare, but it does prepare us a little more to study and learn from Romeo and Juliet. So as we begin to study this play, and by that I mostly mean watch and react to it, I'm going to suggest various resources that are going to help you get more mileage out of this and understand and enjoy it even more. You don't have to use all of these resources, but they will be posted to our class website and made available to you. I do strongly recommend that you watch this video from SparkNotes before starting the play. It gives a quick sort of cartoon summary of the whole play and really helps you to understand better what's happening. As you watch the play, it will be easier and easier to understand some of the old fashioned language if you're not familiar with that type of language already. But at the beginning, this is really going to help you to understand better what's going on. But honestly, as I said before, you can understand a lot of what's happening just by watching the characters and their body language. All right, and there we have it. I hope you feel excited to begin to watch Romeo and Juliet and to be able to respond and think about various scenes from this play.